My name is Bilal. I'm a data person working at Porsche Digital Lab now. Um, yeah, and today, before I jump in, I want to ask you a quick question. Uh, does anyone know what this means? If I, uh, okay. There we go. There we go. It's, it's not a bad word. But, uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's in sign language saying, my name is Bilal. Um, so 5 to 10% of the world's population is hard of hearing or, or deaf and relies on sign language as their primary form of communication. And in, uh, and in this project, I wanted to start to build a system which can, uh, which can deal with that. Um, so more specifically, oops, let's get a bullet point. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay, cool. Um, so specifically, I focused on the American Sign Language because it's in English and I can speak English. Uh, and also they have a very um, active online forum, which is important for me to get data. So every country has its own sort of sign language. There's a German Sign Language, there's a British Sign Language. I focused on the American Sign Language. Um, and specifically uh, on the alphabet, so I had to. I started out trying to translate the entire sign language, and it was a bit uh, much <laughs> given the time constraints. So the American Sign Language is 26 letters, much like ours. It's used um, to spell your name, and also in sign language, there's roughly 10 to 30 thousand words in the dictionary uh, compared to English, where there's almost 200 thousand. And so when there's when there's a word which you can't say, you literally spell it out. So that was sort of the use case of that, um, yeah. Uh, and today I wanted to just walk you through this uh, initial pipeline I made. So this was a project for me as well to, to get better at, uh, to learn more about deep learning and, and building systems. Um, and like most machine learning systems, we start with the data, some pre-processing, uh, feature extraction and machine learning to focus on uh, using convolutional neural networks and specifically some transfer learning uh, with the limited amount of data and put it in a, into a real-time system. Um, the tech stack, uh, beautiful soup with some scraping, a video camera, just to keep it old school. Um, for image pre-processing, I use OpenCV, Python, Pillow, and then scikit-learn, KRAS, and AWS. So I'll throw in a little bit of code here for KRAS and OpenCV just to show how sort of easy they make uh, machine learning and transfer learning these days. So is, is everyone, has people used OpenCV and Keras before? Or? Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Um, so first, what does sign language look like? Um, that's, a, that's an A, for example. Uh, to start off with the data, I just wanted to quickly iterate. So I managed, there's one uh, open source data set available for sign language. This is the American Sign Language Boston University corpus, around 1,500 images of equally balanced classes. Um, it's very clean. You can see it's cropped, taken on a green screen. So I took this as a, as a starting point and uh, went ahead to, to uh, just test out with it. Uh, I'm just quickly, yeah, this is an example of sign language. So that's a UV and a W, fairly distinct. But then as you see like an A, an M, and an N, it becomes extremely similar, so it's a, little, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, the first step when I take the data was just a little bit of pre-processing to get it to work with the transfer learning model, and I'll talk about the model in some detail later. Um, so we take the image, we just make it into a square and pad it, resize it for the neural network architecture. Um, and at the end of it, I had roughly 1,500 images, uh, 55 per class, which is not a lot. And, so I also deal with some data augmentation later. This is also why I use transfer learning. Um, so uh, I took this and I ran it through the VGG16 architecture uh, just for 50 epochs. And I got these like, very pretty uh, curves. And I thought, well, I've, I've cracked it. Like, this, is going, this is going to work. Um, and I, uh, let's move on to the real-time system um, to see how it actually works. And OpenCV makes it very simple using the uh, the, a video capture object, so this connects to your webcam or any sort of camera, and it lets you read in frame by frame, uh, and you can take, apply whatever operations you need to. So in this case, I had a KRS model, which I was applying frame by frame, and then visualizing, um, and that was quite easy to do with OpenCV. Uh, and so I took this quick, uh, quick and dirty model and, um, and tried it out, and uh, it didn't work, and the reason 
why it became obvious in hindsight is the data is, is just not representative of what a webcam and what the real world looks like. The, the lighting conditions are quite complex compared to the, the green, the very clean image which I showed here. Um, you don't have clean, you have to identify the hand in the image and also you might notice here there's the green screen uh, background also was causing a problem. So uh, to deal with that, I decided uh, because I'm using deep learning, let me get some more data. So that was the next step was to go out and uh, increase the data sets uh, through uh, recording people and also scraping forums, uh, engaging with the sign community uh, in the time frame. So this was quite a, a short project. I did it as part of a course and in just a few weeks time and uh, I gathered several gigabytes of video, but um, I only manually labeled around 300 images and I added it to the data set, which wasn't a huge amount, but interesting, interestingly was, was enough, as you'll see, to, um, to, to actually affect the output. So I took these images uh, and now my data set started to look something like this, so different skin colors, different shades, more representative of what you might see in, in the real world. Um, again, uh, so this is iteration two, going through the pre-processing pipeline, this time I pad it. I also dropped the green channel because, uh, because of the, the green screen background, which was just literally an outline around the hand and I think it was causing some problems. It was the network can be learning just to look for a green outline, um, which we don't have. Uh, and then again, resizing it for the neural network. Um, this time I have 2,000 images, um, roughly 75 per class, so still not enough to train anything from scratch. So I went to use uh, transfer learning. And does everyone or does anyone ever know what transfer learning is? Okay, cool. So I can use my pictures. Uh, <laughs> essentially, transfer learning is uh, when we take large uh, pre-trained uh, neural network architectures, often um, such as VGG16, which I think is from the University of Oxford, and we can use them uh, as feature extractors. So these have been trained on um, the ones which are open source are trained on the ImageNet challenge, uh, and then we can repurpose it, use them as feature extractors, take those features and repurpose it for whatever use case. So in, uh, in this, for my purpose, it was a 26 class in the image classification problem, so I could drop that last channel. So this is an example of VGG16. It uses a typical sort of image um, recognition architecture. So there's just convolution blocks followed by max pooling, uh, and at the end, fully connected layers in a soft max output. Uh, and a thousand classes, which is the ImageNet competition. Um, for my purposes, I wanted to, I dropped that classification block and I just added two fully connected layers uh, with a softmax activation. So I get probabilities per letter of the alphabet. Uh, and that lets me uh, predict, um, yeah, predict the alphabet. Um, so all I actually need to do at train time is train that last little uh, classification block after extracting the features once through the, through the network. And uh, so I actually trained it on my laptop in, in something like five minutes on this MacBook Pro. Uh, that's very quickly transfer learning. Um, so in terms of what's available uh, for me to play with, this is all within KRAS. Um, there's a few architectures, VGG16 and 19, which are older, large ones. Uh, ResNet 50, an exception. Uh, so I won't talk about the technical details, but these are all within um, KRAS and they just make it really easy for you to play with. And of particular interest for me was mobile net. So this is a really streamlined sort of compressed and cut down version of the exception network, which is useful for real time applications and especially on mobile phones and things like that. Um, and again, uh, to make use of these, you uh, just go to KRAS and import whichever uh, architecture you want to use. <laughs> uh, and when you do that for transfer learning, you just, you chop off the classification block and you can manually design your own sort of uh, features. You can, yeah, have fun with that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so at this point, I also realized that it would be good to uh, try and increase the data set at some point. And uh, again, in KRAS, you can do this using uh, the image data generator object. Uh, these are just a few parameters, but there are more. Um, so you can rescale here. I've just applied random rotations, shifts, shears, just to make a, to, to, to deal with this really small data set and to, and to try and make the most of what I had. Uh, so just using like a little code snippet there and 
uh, at each training epoch, a random of, uh, a set of random translations and rotations are applied. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, so the results, I did two tests. I wanted to train one with my classification block and also the random forest. So you can see with uh, pretty much all of them, we reach a really high accuracy. And this is just, is it the right letter or not? Uh, it's the top one accuracy. Um, but the key uh, metric for me here, given I wanted, to, I wanted it to be a real-time system, was the average frame uh, rate per second. So your average YouTube video could be anywhere from uh, 30 to 60 frames per second or, or webcam. Uh, but with these, with VGG 16 and ResNet 50, which is what I started out with, you're getting one to two frames per second. It's very laggy. Uh, and just recently, I think it was a month ago, um, they included mobile net into Keras, and so I tried that out, and immediately it, it goes up to five frames per second, just out of the box putting it in. And you notice the accuracy as well is 99.7 uh, using the classification block, but with a random forest, uh, it doesn't quite work as well. Um, and these tests were all just on my MacBook Pro. Um, yeah, uh, might have damaged the CPU a bit, <laughs> but. Um, so I went ahead and I took the uh, mobile net architecture and I included that into my, uh, my demo system. Uh, again, going through the same loop, so capturing a video, um, doing the prediction and visualizing. It's all, on, uh, it's all on GitHub if you, the weights are up there if you want to try it out. I made a quick video, uh, just to give you an example. Uh, <laughs> okay. So this is VGG16, it's extremely laggy, but you can kind of see that's an O, it's a C. Um, yeah, okay, and uh, if you do it with MobileNet, it just moves much faster, much quicker, and it's, uh, yeah, easier, it works much better. Um, so as you can probably tell, there's a few, there's, well, quite a few, this is a, project, a work in progress, there's a few things I want to do, a lot of ideas I have, uh, and I'd welcome your ideas and criticisms, and. Uh, if you're interested in collaborating. Um, but I see a few ways, ways forward with it. Well, getting more data is one. Actually moving on to translating words and sentences, so dynamic sort of, um, yeah, so taking into the time series aspect into account. Um, also thinking about the real-time system. In that video I showed you, I just had a center crop, which I was taking, um, and, trans and um, doing the prediction on that crop but really it would be in interesting to try and track the hand and follow it. And I tried that with uh, skin thresholding and various things, but nothing is quite robust. So it turns out uh, uh, face detection is really well implemented, but hand detection is, is a really open uh, and active research area because our hands can take so many shapes. So standard computer vision features don't quite work. Um, and then again, I, I'm also working on porting some of this to core ML and uh, also feedback from the signing community was that a system like this is very useful for us who can, uh, so we can understand people, but what they would love is, is, is a well-implemented speech-to-text system, which apparently nobody, uh, nobody has um, done for them yet. So these are just ideas, and I'd love if anyone was interested in collaborating to, um, to get in touch. Um, thank you, I'd like to say thank you to the signing community for helping me out and the data science retreat, and I'm uh, happy to take any questions and talk about any of the te technical aspects in some more detail.